it is nine o'clock Central Standard Time, four one twenty one, and that's not an April Fool's joke. We want to welcome you to the Dallas Independent School District STEM Environmental Education Center virtual field trip. We want to say a very special welcome to Fred Florence Young Men's Leadership Academy and Dallas ISD. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed the virtual field trip. Teachers, if you're watching and you have not registered, please do so. Go to www.tiny.cc slash EEC register and sign up. This is just for our attendance records only. This morning, we're gonna do a program called Flow of Energy. During this virtual field trip, students will recognize that radiant energy from the sun is transferred into chemical energy through the process of photosynthesis and describe the flow of energy through living systems, including food chains, food webs, and energy pyramids. Mr. Broughton will introduce you to photosynthesis. Mr. Monroe will talk about food chains, Mr. Maris about food webs, and Ms. Fuller will cover energy pyramids. This is a, a, a virtual field trip, so you cannot ask us verbal questions, uh, if, but you can ask questions. Go to www.tiny.cc slash CEC space question space answer. Send in your questions. We'll do our best to answer them during the program. If not, I will answer them and send them to your teacher and they will share them with you. And now I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Mr. Broughton is going to talk to you about photosynthesis. Thank you, Dr. Gorman. Yes, this uh, segment is all about photosynthesis. So let me get my presentation started here. We're going to start off by looking at photosynthesis at the global level. And uh, we're going to watch a video to do that. And this is a time lapse video of photosynthesis seen from space. And as you watch the video, think about these questions. What factors control changes in photosynthesis on land and in the oceans over time? How do plants respond to seasonal changes in sunlight? And where is photosynthesis most prevalent on land and in the ocean and why? So let's take a look at this video. It's about two minutes long. I'll pause it a couple of times to discuss some of it, but just watch what's happening. I'm just going to pause it right about there. So it started off looking about like this, where the northern hemisphere was mostly dark. And then it got brighter. And now it's dark again. And so one year has passed because this is the season of winter. When it was spring and summer, it got brighter here. And now winter has come back. So that that's the time lapse part of that. You just watched a whole year go by on Earth. So we'll watch it a little more. And now you can see that that green signifies carbon absorption on land and the blue signifies carbon absorption in the oceans. So on land, plants are doing photosynthesis, uh, making their own food and absorbing a lot of carbon. In the oceans, phytoplankton are doing photosynthesis and absorbing a lot of the um, carbon that's in the air. And so there we just saw another year go by. So I believe that's two years now. And they're going to show you what month it is now. So like I said, when it's all dark in the northern hemisphere, it's winter. And this is how it is right now in April. This is April 1st. So that's springtime. And now it's getting to be uh, summertime. And as it starts getting darker again, that's, that's fall. And that happens because as the Earth revolves around the sun, it's tilted on its axis. So sometimes the northern hemisphere is tilted towards the sun during the summer. Sometimes we're tilted away from the sun during winter and uh, that so causes the seasons and also causes these changes in photosynthesis. But if you also look at Northern Africa, it really never gets very bright green. And um, that is because that's where the Sahara Desert is. Some areas of the planet just are not gonna produce um, a lot of photosynthesis because there's no plants to do that or phytoplankton since it's land there. Uh, one other thing that can 
uh, determine how much photosynthesis is going to uh, take place is human activity. So if we're cutting down trees or polluting the ocean, less photosynthesis is going to happen as well. So that was the global perspective. Now we're going to look at just an individual organism perspective. So there's a plant and how photosynthesis works is the plant takes in light energy or radiant energy from the sun. It absorbs that carbon dioxide from the air, takes in water through its roots, and uses those three things to produce carbohydrates, or sometimes those are called sugar or glucose. A way to summarize all three would be to just to say it's chemical energy, that's stored energy um, in its leaves. And then another a byproduct of photosynthesis that that plant gives us oxygen uh, for us to breathe. Now that's kind of a elementary level uh, picture of photosynthesis. Here's more of the middle school level. So it's still the same thing happening. Radiant energy from the sun is absorbed by those leaves. Carbon dioxide is absorbed by the leaves. Water is absorbed by the roots. And those three uh, produce sugar, which is called carbohydrates or glucose, depending on which book you read or which website you look at. But it's chemical energy. It's six carbon atoms, 12 hydrogen atoms, and six oxygen atoms that combine together to form that sugar or glucose. And then it also produces oxygen. So here is the chemical formula for photosynthesis. You have six molecules of carbon dioxide plus six molecules of water. Add that radiant energy from the sun and it, and it yields one molecule of sugar or glucose and six molecules of oxygen for us to breathe. And here's one more picture of photosynthesis. Uh, right here you've still you've got the leaves absorbing that radiant energy from the sun carbon dioxide going in, water going in, uh, sugars being produced by the leaves and oxygen being produced by those leaves. But it is a little more complicated. Um, there's, a, there's some um, what are called intermediate products in photosynthesis. So there's a light dependent reaction that happens where um, the light comes in, the water comes in and that's where the oxygen is produced. But then there's a light independent reaction too that's called the Calvin cycle where the uh, chemical energy is actually produced. And this is a little above middle school level, but just so you know, when you get to high school or, or study this in college, you're not shocked to find out it's not just uh, the, the picture that I showed you right before. So here's, the, that was the um, plant level. Now we're going to watch one more video. It's about a three minute video where um, we go inside a leaf and see what's happening. So there's captions that explain what's going on. So be sure to read those while you uh, watch this.
So there is that video of inside the leaf. If you didn't understand all of that, uh, that is just fine. Um, Cause that is a pretty advanced uh, video to watch, but I, I thought it was kind of cool how it shows actual photosynthesis happening inside the cells of a leaf. Hopefully you recognize some words like nucleus or ribosome, but if um, you didn't understand everything, that's fine. What you need to for sure know is this, that uh, during photosynthesis, a plant takes in radiant energy from the sun, carbon dioxide and water, and produces that chemical energy and oxygen for us to breathe. And then here's the, the, the chemical um, formula you need to know for uh, photosynthesis. So let me um, stop sharing my screen here. I'm going to switch over to an iPad. So just give me about 10 seconds to get switched over. And then we're going to go outside and see uh, actual leaves that are doing photosynthesis. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah. Um, so I'm going to head outside here and uh, let me get my screen flipped around so you can see where I'm walking. And uh, we're going to head over to a tree where I've tried to do a couple simple investigations to see what would happen. Um, if I put a couple of different bags over some leaves, but as you kind of look around here, you can see that the grass is greening up. Even grass does photosynthesis. All green plants uh, make their own food through the process of photosynthesis. And a lot of the leaves are starting to come in on these trees now. But right over here, uh, we have a oak tree. And this first investigation, I put a, a, a clear Ziploc bag over some leaves. And you can see all that moisture that is formed inside that bag and that is because leaves also give off water um, and that's called transpiration so that but that ziploc bag was completely dry when i put it on there and already it's collected quite a bit of water that's evaporating out of the tree even though it's uh still a little bit cool out this morning and i put another kind of uh a bag i guess or an envelope over some other leaves to see if they would change color having been in the dark. So let me get this uh, bag off of here. Or envelope, I guess it's not a, not a bag, but when I pull that off, those leaves actually still look pretty green. I would say just as green as these leaves up here that I never put any covering on. So I was thinking that by putting them in the dark, they would change maybe to a paler shade of green or maybe even brown. And I only waited one day. So maybe if I left that envelope on there for a whole week, that would happen. But in just one day, I would say uh, these ones that were covered up don't look too much different than the ones that weren't covered up. Uh, so sometimes investigations go the way you think they are and sometimes they don't. And so then sometimes you have to make adjustments and, and um, find another way to do the investigation. But now I'm going to turn things back over to Dr. Gorman to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Broughton. And the question is, uh, they showed us all about what happens, but why is photosynthesis important? Photosynthesis is critical for the existence of the vast majority of life on Earth. It is the way in which virtually all energy in the biosphere becomes available to living things. As primary producers, photosynthetic organisms form the base of Earth's food webs and are consumed directly or indirectly by all higher life forms. Additionally, almost all the oxygen in the atmosphere is due to the process of photosynthesis. If photosynthesis ceased, there would soon be little food or other organic matter on Earth. Most organisms would disappear and Earth's atmosphere would eventually become nearly devoid of gaseous oxygen. In other words, goodbye humans. And now Mr. Munro is gonna tell us about food chains. Good morning, students. My name is Mr. Munro and 
we're going to be looking at the transfer of energy through food chains. And I'm gonna get right into the presentation, which is a PowerPoint. And at the conclusion of that PowerPoint, I'm going to get some examples of some, use some examples that are actually live animals that we consider to be consumers. So bear with me while I share my screen with you guys. Food chains and the transfer of energy. Well, Mr. Broughton showed you or gave you a lot to think about as far as what we call producers, plants. Another name for plants or producers is they are called autotrophs. Autotrophs are also called producers because they produce all the food that heterotrophs use. Without autotrophs, there would be no life on this planet, as you've heard Dr. Gorman state, and basically Mr. Broughton also mentioned. Some examples are plants and algae. Out here at the Environmental Ed Center, we've got the Post Oak Preserve. And if you were here with us today, we would be taking a nature trail walk where you would hear a lot about the trees and the plants that make up the population of autotrophs in the Post Oak Preserve. We also have two working ponds and a lake that also has an autotroph growing in it that we call green algae. Very important, and you've heard uh, Mr. Broughton talk about the importance of what plants or producers or autotrophs do for the organisms that also inhabit our planet. Here are perfect examples of autotrophs. Now, this substance that you see here on the aquatic system there, that is green algae. You know, scientists believe that green algae was one of the first forms of life on our planet billions or millions of years ago. Heterotrophs. Heterotrophs are actually organisms that do not make their own food. Another term for heterotroph is consumer because they consume other organisms in order to live. Examples are rabbits, deer, and mushrooms. And those examples we do find out here at the Environmental Land Center. Uh, we now have a pretty good population of white-tailed deer, and we also have rabbits that are running around. And from time to time, when conditions are just right, we will find mushrooms growing in the Post Oak Preserve, and there, there was, those mushrooms are feeding on what we call the leaf litter that is covering the forest floor. Consumers. Well, scavengers and Detritivores feed on the tissue of dead organisms, both plants and animals. Vultures and crows and shrimp are perfect examples of those. And we do see a variety, in fact, not a variety, but we do see a lot of vultures out here because things die and the vultures come in and we call the vultures the air patrol that kind of helps clean up our world. Crows will also do the same thing. And there are certain types of shrimp that will also do the same process, feeding on both plants and animals that have deceased or died. Consumers, herbivores eat only plants. Perfect examples are cows, elephants, and giraffes. And out here at the Environmental Land Center, we have a variety of cows. And some of the most impressive cows that we have are the Black Angus, very large cows that consume a lot of plant life. In fact, they consume a lot of what we call hay. Here's some pictures of those organisms. Of course, our cows, the Angus, 
they're a pretty good size and their color is a little different from the cows you see in this picture. They are black. Now we don't have any elephants. You'd have to go to a zoo or go to their natural habitat in other countries to find elephants. And we don't have any giraffes. You would have to go again to the zoo or to some of those countries or uh, areas where those animals are found to be indigenous. Consumers, carnivores eat only meat. And some of the well-known uh, carnivores that we have in our world today are lions, tigers, and sharks. We know for sure that they are meat eaters. And here are some pictures of those organisms. Of course, you might find a, uh, a lion at the zoo or get a chance to see lions at the zoo or tigers at the zoo or uh, maybe visit some uh, world aquarium to see sharks. But students, we have carnivores that live right here around us. For example, we have bobcats out here. We also have uh, uh, snakes that are considered to be carnivores. There are a variety of organisms out here that are considered to be carnivores that eat meat only. Omnivores are organisms that eat both plants and animals. Good examples would be bears and humans. You know, people have a tendency to eat plant life in the form of different vegetables and fruits. And we also eat or consume a variety of meat. Okay, so that makes us omnivores. And you know what? We also have humans that consider themselves being very healthy and they consume only plant life. We call those type of people vegetarian. So they play the role or they would be considered to be omnivores or herbivores. Now, omnivores eat both, as you see in this picture, the bear and the human. And you know, there's a little turtle and I should have gotten this little guy out so I could show you. There's a very common turtle that we have in our aquatic systems out here called a red ear slider. And they fall into that category of being a omnivore because not only will they just eat little fish or insects and other live organisms, but they will also eat the roots from some aquatic plants. So they are considered to be an omnivore. Consumers, decomposers. Boy, we would live in a very nasty, nasty world if it wasn't for those consumers that we consider to be decomposers. They absorb any dead material and they break it down into simple nutrients or fertilizers that can be reused again most of, most of the time in the soil. And some good examples of those are bacteria and mushrooms. The mushrooms that grow in our postal preserve they will help break down the leaf litter, the dead leaves that are covering the forest floor. Now, from time to time, we do see mushrooms come up when the conditions are just right. And they will be a variety of different colors and different shapes. The transfer of energy. When a zebra eats the grass, it does not obtain all the energy the grass has. Much of it is not eaten. When a lion eats a zebra, it does not get all the energy from the zebra. Much of it is lost as heat. The two previous examples of energy transfer show that no organism ever receives all of the energy from the organism they just ate. Only 10% of the energy from one trophic level is transferred to the next. This is called the 10% law. Trophic levels. Now, when we talk about trophic levels, we're talking about energy moved from one organism to another when it is eaten. Each step in this transfer of energy is known 
as a trophic level. The main trophic levels are producers, consumers, and decomposers. Food change. The energy flow from one trophic level to the other is known as a food chain. A food chain is, a, is simple and direct. It involves one organism at each trophic level. Primary consumers eat autotrophs. In other words, they eat producers. Secondary consumers eat the primary consumers. Tertiary consumers eat the secondary consumers. Decomposers, bacteria and fungi, fungi they, that, they break down dead organisms and recycle the material back into the environment. Now I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and get a couple of my friends out to show you examples of uh, certain types of consumers. Now the first one I'm going to get out is going to be considered to be what you might call a secondary consumer. Now we know that a secondary consumer consumes a primary consumer, right? Bear with me just for a second. This is Hoppy the bullfrog. Now, Hoppy is an American bullfrog. This guy is considered to be in an aquatic system like our ponds out here, a secondary consumer. His favorite food would be some type of insect that hangs around the pond. It could be a dragonfly if he's quick enough, maybe even a grasshopper if he gets close enough. But those organisms, for example, the grasshopper, would be considered to be a primary consumer because it is going to consume plant life or it is a herbivore. Whoa, Hoppy. Now, if I was to let him go, he would be all over this place. But he's a very large American bullfrog. He's a secondary consumer. We'll put him back right quick. Now, my next little friend that I want to show you is considered to be the next trophic level. And he is considered to be what we call a tertiary consumer. If he had a chance, he would try to consume Hoppy the bullfrog. And what we mean by tertiary is that there is nothing in the pond or the environment in which this animal lives that would be looking to kill and consume him to get that 10% of energy, okay? So bear with me because if I get this guy out the wrong way, guess what will happen? He'll bite me and you guys get a chance to see a grown man hollering and screaming, okay? Bear with me. This is Snappy, the snapping turtle. Now Snappy is a regular snapping turtle. He can live to be 50 years old and weigh as much as 50 pounds. I usually use Snappy in lessons to talk about very special characteristics that animals have that we call adaptations. He has a lot of them. But basically, I'm showing you him today to show you an example of a tertiary consumer. He can be very aggressive and he definitely could tear Hoppy the bullfrog all apart because he can become very aggressive. See, that's why they call him a snapping turtle. Now I'm gonna put him up. And I'm going to conclude by saying, remember the 10% rule? And remember that each level in a uh, food chain is called the trophic level, okay? Now, I'm gonna turn it back over to uh, Dr. Gorman so that if any of you have any questions, he can probably answer those for you. You guys have a good day now. Thank you, Mr. Monroe. Wow, that snappy was, was that's quite exciting, wasn't he? He's pretty fast. Uh, one of the students says you
you've probably seen Khan Academy. It's a pretty reliable source of information. Okay, a food chain is a linear sequence of organisms through which nutrients and energy pass as one organism eats another. In a food chain, each organism occupies a different uh, tropic level defined by how many energy transfers separate it from the basic input of the chain. There you go. All right, now Ms. Ramirez is gonna talk about the food webs. Hello, my name is Mr. Maris, and we're going to be learning about food webs and how it relates to owl pellets. So let me go ahead and show you guys a skeleton of an owl. So make some observations. What do you guys notice about the skull of an owl? And how do you think its, owl, its structure of the skull uh, would allow it to be an excellent hunter? So notice those big eye sockets and that sharp beak. And later on, we'll also be taking a look at what's inside an owl pellet. So be thinking about what do you think an owl pellet is? Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you guys so we can start our presentation. And let me pull up our um, slide deck. Uh, sorry about the delay. So I do have a couple of two essential questions for you guys. So hopefully by the end of this presentation, you will be able to answer these two questions. The first question is, what can you learn by dissecting an owl pellet? And the second question is, what role does an owl play in its ecosystem? So keep those two questions in mind as we go through the presentation. And as you can see, we have some little video clips of owls spitting out an owl pellet. So an owl pellet is not poop. Instead, it's just the regurgitated material that an owl's body cannot digest. Uh, so essentially, it's a pellet full of fur and bones or other skeletons uh, that cannot be digested. So let's take a look at our next slide. Uh, just really quickly uh, examine the infographic. It shows us how owl pellets are formed. Uh, so owls don't have teeth. Again, lots of birds don't have teeth. Um, so they end up uh, using their sharp beak to grab their prey animal. They will eat it whole. Um, and then it will travel through what's called the proventriculus. It's like its first stomach. And then eventually it will make its way into the ventriculus, also called the gizzard. And that gizzard is a special organ that contracts, meaning it squeezes back and forth and it helps to grind and break up whatever that owl ate. So again, uh, owls don't have teeth. So instead that gizzard is a special substitute that helps to break down and grind whatever it ate. Um, and then uh, from that gizzard, whatever can be digested will move further down the digestive tract. And then things that can't be digested like the fur and bones will eventually make its way back up through the owl's esophagus. And then will eventually come back out through the owl's mouth in the form of a pellet. And uh, that's usually about eight to 10 hours later. Uh, so here's some quick little pictures of some various bird pellets. Uh, so on the left, you can kind of compare and contrast the pellets from various owls and other bird species. Uh, so notice the difference in size and color and what they are consisting of. And then over here in the right, we have uh, an example of how an owl pellet or other pellets uh, can decompose over time. Uh, so again, you can take a moment to pause the video and make your observations and compare and contrast the different things that you're seeing as well. And then in our next slide, I was actually super excited to find uh, some, my, some of my very own pellets outside. And so these were some pellets that were found out by a pond near a farm. Um, and I believe these are heron pellets, simply because we normally see a lot of herons by this particular pond. Um, and it was consisted of lots of crawfish remains. So you can see all those little claws from the crawfish that it ate. Uh, so again, herons are excellent predators. Um, just like an owl is, and they also form those pellets. And then here's another owl pellet I found um, also at the same farm. And again, I was super excited to dissect it. Um, it's usually very rare that I find an actual owl pellet on my own. Normally when we dissect these in school, we order them from a science company. Uh, but again, you can take a look at the owl pellet here and see if you can find any bones amongst um, all this fur that you see here. And I can actually see a, a nice skull here and then some other little bones hidden throughout. So it's always pretty cool to dissect them. Maybe you guys can go on a hike and see if you can find any of these pellets. Um, and now to talk really quickly about the role of an owl in a food web. So you learned earlier about food chains. Well, a food web is just a collection of food chains and they're showing the transfer of energy among organisms. 
So take a look at our diagram here and think about what role does an owl play in an ecosystem? Now, of course, we know just like with our food chains uh, in our food webs, we also have the sun and the sun is the source of all energy within a food web or food chain. Then, of course, just like in a food chain, we have our producers or our autotrophs. They are using that sun's energy uh, to undergo photosynthesis. And in doing so, they're releasing oxygen for our consumers. And they're also providing food for our herbivore consumers as well as our omnivore consumers. And then, of course, we also have uh, the animals, the consumers, or heterotrophs, those organisms that can't make their own energy, so they have to eat other organisms for food. And our owl is an example of a consumer or heterotroph. And if we take a look at our food web here, we notice that the owl in this food web is a prey and a predator. So it's a, it's a predator in the sense that it's eating birds, other rodents and other things like chipmunks, uh, but it's also a prey item. In this diagram, we can see that the red-tailed hawk can actually prey on uh, the owl as well. So within a food web, an owl can be both a predator and a prey. And then in our next little thing, quick question for you guys, think about where would decomposers fit within this food web and see if you can explain that. And what we're gonna get ready to do next, we're gonna do an owl pellet dissection to see if we can identify any bones. Uh, now, typically when we dissect an owl pellet, the most common uh, skeletons and bone remains that you're gonna find belong to uh, the rodent family. Think of your mice or rats. Um, it's less common to find shrew, moles, or birds, uh, so those are a little bit more rare to find, but just so you know what they look like, uh, here's our cute little mole over here. Notice their long uh, nose and also those big feet or claws, and then here's our cute little shrew as well. Uh, these two guys are in the same family, so that's why they look rather similar. Uh, so it's important to note that scientists can learn a lot from owl pellets. It can help scientists identify what bird species are in that area, but it can also tell us a lot about what those owls or other birds are eating. And it can tell us about the diversity of prey available in an area. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop our screen share and we're gonna take a look at some of the less common things that you can find in an owl pellet. Again, here's our bird skull. So see those big eye sockets and that beak, obviously. Again, these are a little bit harder to find um, in owl pellets just because most birds, think of our owls, owls are nocturnal. Um, so most of our small songbirds are not nocturnal. So the owls are probably not gonna find these too often uh, during their nighttime hunts. And then here's our cute little mole. Uh, this is the mole uh, forelimb, the limbs, so the, the long claws or paws that you can see. And the moles use these for digging. Uh, again, those are super cute animals. And then the most common skull and remains that you're gonna find belong to the rodents. So you can see those big rodent teeth as well. So I'm gonna try and do a quick uh, screen share uh, so you can see it, the actual owl pellet. So let me get that started. It might take uh, just a second for me to pull up our screen sharing so I can connect my iPad to Zoom. Uh, so while you're uh, waiting for me to get that together, be thinking about what do you think uh, we can find in our owl pellets. So here we have an owl pellet that I've kind of already broken apart, but remember it looks like this. And again, you can just use your hands to break them apart. Uh, these come from Carolina Biological, so they've already been autoclaved and sterilized, so you can just pull them apart with your hands. And a lot of it is just a mass of fur. So think of maybe fur from a, a rodent or a rat. Um, and then you can pull apart and look at these tiny little bones that are left behind. And then if we take a look over here, we have some good examples of um, some other little bone fragments. So we get a lot of jaws, some little teeth right here from the, the rodents as well. The skulls are the cool ones to look at. So again, another rodent skull with those big eye sockets and then those teeth right there. And then some other things that you guys can look at. Sometimes you might have a little identification sheet that looks like this. So we can see that we have a skull right here that we can match up with this picture. We have some jaw bones and we can match up over here. Uh, these super skinny thin pieces are rib fragments. And then we have this super tiny one. I know it's kind of hard to see in the camera. 
uh, that belong to the tiny vertebrate of our rodent. We have this weird one that kind of looks like a Y and it has a hole in the middle. Uh, so this one is part of the shoulder. We call it the scapula. We have this big thick bone over here uh, that's probably part of the femur. And the femur is part of the leg bone. And then we can also find little fragments from the arms and legs uh, like the radius. So there's lots of cool things that you guys can find within an owl pellet. Uh, so I'm gonna stop our, our screen share and we're gonna give it back to Dr. Gorman uh, to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Ramirez. First question is, what level of the food web does the owl occupy? The producer grass is the first tropic level, the primary consumer vole is the secondary tropic level, and the barn owl is the third tropic level. Now we also had another question and it was, what is the difference between a food chain and a food web? A food chain follows one path of energy and materials between species. A food web is more complex and is a whole system of connected food chains in a food web. Organisms are placed into different tropic levels. Thank you for those questions. And thank you, Ms. Ramirez. <coughs> Excuse me. And now Ms. Fuller is gonna introduce you to the energy pyramids. Good morning. My name is Mrs. Fuller. This is my lab assistant, Lauren. Lauren is an omnivore. She eats a lot of corn and other kinds of plant material and she likes to go out and dig in the yard. She's free range. <laughs> But she also likes to eat bugs and crickets and uh, all kinds of worms, things like that. So she's, she's, a, she's an omnivore. I'm going to show you a, a wonderful graphic organizer called an ecological energy pyramid. And it's going to help make all of this very simple. So whoever came up with this idea was a brilliant person, let me tell you. And I really appreciate them and the work that they did to help us understand this. Now, what we have here is a food web and it's very complicated. It's not as complicated as an ocean food web, which is just nothing but lines. It's pretty amazing. But when you're starting to think, look at this and think, well, which is the first trophic level and all that sort of stuff. It's not really evident too, too much. So let's look at a graphic organizer that's gonna help us with this. But before we do that, let's look at a couple essential questions. Number one, how much energy is lost in an energy pyramid moving from one trophic level to the next? And this is gonna be a limiting factor on the size of the energy pyramid. Number two, what is the term given to the organisms that occupy the topmost section of the energy pyramid? So keep these in, keep these two things in mind. What's at the top and also uh, how much energy is lost as it moves, as the energy moves through the pyramid? Well, there it is. There's our energy pyramid over there on the, the left. And what it did was they took the food web over there on the right and put it into the graphic organizer, like a Venn diagram or, or anything like that, um, Freyer model. Well, it's the same sort of thing, but it just sort of simplifies everything and puts it on different levels. Now, you've, where does the energy enter the, uh, the ecological uh, energy pyramid. Well, it's from the sun. Remember, almost all energy that we have here on our earth comes from the sun. It enters down there at the bottom layer where it says plants. And the plants can uh, convert uh, the, the energy of the sun uh, using water and carbon dioxide, put those three things together and it yields uh, sugar or glucose. Uh, and so that's the biggest part of the energy uh, pyramid uh, because as the energy moves up the pyramid to the top, 90% is lost. Only 10% goes to the next level. That's why this has a pyramid shape. Each level 
is 90 uh, 90% uh, smaller than the level that preceded it. And, and uh, Mr. Uh, Monroe talked a little bit about this uh, because um, we've got all those plants at the bottom, but they are not completely consumed by the herbivores. Uh, a lot of them just die and fall down and then they, they go to the decomposers uh, on, on the soil. So the herbivores will eat the plants and little animals like Lauren chicken will uh, also eat plants, but she'll also eat some of the little herbivores. She'll eat the crickets and the grasshoppers and the worms, guys like that. Above that, you've got primary predators, snakes and frogs. And snakes are wonderful predators. They're carnivores. Um, and they're the favorite food of a lot of animals, including snakes. So uh, above them at the very top are the secondary predators. And the ones at the top, the ones that are not hunted by other organisms are called apex predators. Apex means the peak or the top, at the very top. Now you might say, well, how come, why is it only four or five levels? Why isn't it eight or nine levels? The reason why, remember, we're gonna lose 90% of the energy uh, at each level, only 10% is moving up. When you uh, start with um, the plants down there, by the time you get up to the secondary predators, uh, get up to the apex predators, only 1,000th of the amount of energy that was present at the autotroph level actually makes it up to the apex predator. Now autotroph, auto means self-troph, means nutrients or food. So the plants make their own food with sunlight, energy, water, and carbon dioxide. The heterotroph, hetero means different. So they get their food from someplace different by eating either plants or other animals. Now, at some point, all of these guys are gonna die. They're either gonna die because they're caught and eaten or they're gonna die because uh, they die of old age, which is a little bit on the rare side in nature. But whatever dies, whether it's plants or animals, it goes to the soil where we have the detrivores or the decomposers. And these are things like fungi, bacteria, actinomycetes, worms, spring tails, millipedes, all kinds of things of all those different organisms. So the two that do most of the de decomposing are fungi and bacteria. Everybody helps, but those two uh, do the heavy lifting, as you might say. So let's uh, very quickly go through these different levels. There's our autotroph, the green plants. You're familiar with all of these different things nice to eat for us as well as for the animals. Here are our little herbivores. We're all familiar with squirrels and rabbits and grasshoppers. Uh, we live on the Blackland Prairie and the primary consumer of uh, prairie grasses are not bison or cattle or antelope. It's actually the grasshopper because there, there are billions of them. Um, predators. Uh, the predators don't have to be great big giant things like tigers. They can be possums and lauren chicken and the rat snakes. And decomposers. So there's our fungi, our worms, and our springtails right there. So let me get out of this. I'm going to stop my share. And we're back together. I'm going to show you a characteristic of an herbivore. This is a really big animal. This horse was probably about 14 or 15 hands tall. And look at the teeth. This is a, the teeth of a grazer, an animal that has to crunch on grass in order to get enough food to support this huge animal. And I'm going to show you some uh, one other set of teeth very quickly. I'm going to show you the teeth of, of an apex predator. This is an apex predator from the ocean. This is a shark. Look at all the rows of teeth this shark has. When he loses a tooth, he doesn't have to wait to grow a new one. All he has to do is 
the, the one that's missing, the one behind it just folds forward. He always has a full complement of teeth to munch around on the fish that he catches. So he's at the top. He's an apex predator. Thank you for joining us for the Ecological Energy Pyramid. If you have any questions about this, Dr. Gorman will be more than happy to answer those questions. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Ms. Fuller. And this question, this student uh, really likes the definitions and um, we're going to give him the definition of the energy pyramid. Uh, after it's actually probably we should have given the definition first because you did such a great job of covering every part of it. All right, energy pyramid is sometimes referred to as an ecological pyramid or tropic pyramid. It is a graphical representation between various organisms in an ecosystem. The pyramid is composed of several bars. Each bar has a different tropic level to represent. The order of these bars is based on who feeds on whom. It represents the energy flow in the ecosystem. Energy flows from the bottom of the pyramid where we have producers upwards. The height of the bars is normally the same. However, each bar has a different width depending on the quantity of the element being measured. All right, now I'm going to share my screen. During this virtual field trip, students recognize that radiant energy from the sun is transformed into chemical energy through the process of photosynthesis and describe the flow of energy through living systems, including food chains, food webs, and energy pyramids. Mr. Broughton introduced you to photosynthesis. Mr. Monroe covered food chains. Ms. Ramirez talked about food webs and Ms. Fuller described the energy pyramids. Thank you teachers, how did we do? If you would, please fill out the form at www.tiny.cc slash EEC and send it back to us. It's a very short form, but we certainly would appreciate it. Thank you again. Hope you have a great day, but more importantly, I hope you guys have a great life.